This is Reflection, written by Trin, SSJ Trinity. Part 13 of Surrogate, the Director's Cut. The rating is Teen and Up Audiences. The category is General. No archive warnings apply. The fandom is Malevolent, the podcast. Additional tags. No, Hoster, that is not why your first plan went wrong. Hoster, stop. He won't stop. We can have a tiny divorce as a treat. Voices by Flamia as Hoster, Lynn Larsh as John, Jasper as Arthur, Vampirism as the narrator and Pharaoh, Christopher as Kiega, SSJ Trinity, Kriva, and Somnia as the work introduction. Editing by Flamia, directed by Vampirism, transcript by Saffron, created and posted with permission from the authors of Surrogate, the Director's Cut. Hester plants some dangerous seeds with intent to let them grow to fruition. Or, they can have a little divorce as a treat. Purpose aside, outer god cautions aside, desperation and pain aside, this new game is fun. Stage one certainly is, anyway. Is not enough. And oh, the way Arthur flinches as John is spurred into abandoning English again, the way Arthur curls down over his untouched encebollado de pescado. John does not know. Yet. He's eating fine. Leave him alone. Arthur clenches his spoon. Wonderful. And awful at the same time. Like those two marks, Haster is of two minds when it comes to Arthur's pain, but he knows which mind is his. He is less than for John. John seems shocked, looks down at the soup, registers how little Arthur's actually put in his mouth, and he would not have if not for Haster. <sighs> Fucking hell, Arthur, will you just eat the damn soup? I'm not hungry. If it is slightly more like his old self, just a tiny edge, just the barest hint of defiance, Pastor can forgive that. Arthur isn't healing, exactly, not yet. But between John's mark and Haster's, he is bolstered, spiritual bones set in a position where he can. And John does not know, yet. Arthur, eat the soup. Arthur sighs and dips his spoon. Haster retreats. For now. Stage two is even better. The soil is turned, and now Haster plants. John, he requires more water. What? Arthur plays, shoulders tensed at the familiar, gravelly sounds of a language he cannot comprehend. Arthur has stopped asking what John is saying because John refuses to answer. And Haster knows why. John feels guilt for talking to Haster so much, for communing with the enemy, but John has to. They need each other. Neither is whole. Haster will not let him forget that again. She drinks too little. He is the hard guy. How can you tell? John, can't you feel it? John can't remember how. He can't remember how to use the mark to access all that Arthur is, thinks, feels, does. But Haster can, and he will hold that out like the most tantalizing lure. Arthur, it's time to drink some water. What? Water. No. John bullies him until he drinks. So unnecessary. 
John could sway him if he remembered how, but he does not. At least it's John's attention. Arthur drinks that too, parched. John still does not realize. Hester retreats for now. It's been five weeks since marking. Stage three is well underway. The watering. John is, at this point, easy to enrage. All Haster has to do is talk about Arthur. About things in Arthur that John can't see. About things in Arthur that John can't feel. About Arthur, good or bad. And he has John's full attention. And if it is good to have that, not whole, not yet, but closer. Neither of them have to say, because what would be the point of speaking it out loud? And if it is good that this makes Arthur feel isolated, well, there's no need to say that either. Out the window, Faro is learning to ride, a tiny white-clad spot upon the back of a dragon, held in place by Dis. Faro looks like she's having the time of her life. Arthur does not know because John forgot to tell him. It was a magnificent piece, you absolute bastard. John is irritated because Haster put down the first of the Ode Jubilees. It was not one of his best. He still owes me two more and a third current Jubilee besides. We need to be better than that. But you misunderstand. I am not accusing him. I know he can't help it. He's not well. John's tremor is a beautiful thing, and Haster cannot wait to feel it inside him. He cannot wait to be whole. Outside the window, Faroe's happy squeal travels right to them, and Arthur lifts his head. What's happening out there? She's trading. Haster is so glad John hasn't been more reasonable about this. She... She sounds happy, though. She... Not now, Arthur. What the fuck do you mean he's not well? And Arthur slumps back down, aching to see his daughter do whatever made her so happy, aching to at least know what she does, but left still in the dark. He's weakening. To be fair, part of that is my fault. Part? The prison beds were not kind to him. And bad damage has not been addressed. What we are looking at now, John, is that in a few years, his heart will have trouble. His kidneys already do have trouble. He barely moves. And his calorie deficit has led to muscle degeneration. John, you should know this. I shouldn't have to be telling you this. John is puffing like a bellows again. Then why the fuck are you telling me? Which is a funny sentence to hear, because for whatever reason... John uses fuck in English in the middle of an otherwise alien sentence. And because it's fun, Haster tells him outright what he's doing. Because while I loathe him, you don't. And I want you to come home. If taking better care of him is what I have to do to earn your trust, then so be it. John goes quiet. John, if you will let me, I can help you. Let you? You hold all the damn cards in this. True. But working with you instead of against you is better for us both. And for us. Don't you agree? Out the window, Dis has decided Faroe's seat is good enough that the dragon can leap, not fly, not quite yet, but for one amazing moment, they are off the ground. John, what's 
happening. Not Poro is learning to run. Haster uses the syrupy voice he has of late every time he addresses Arthur in private, because that, too, is part of the game. She is on the back of a dragon. Arthur sits right the fuck up and drops his spoon. A dragon? Is that safe? She, oh yes. Her trainer is there, holding her from behind. The dragon is on the ground, not flying, and is the gentlest breed. Three times the size of a horse, long old enough that her fire is quenched, she is completely safe to ride. Thoreau is dwarfed on the old mare's back. Her simple white linen is stark upon the mottled red of the aged beast, and the laugh you heard came as she turned her face toward the sun, for joy and freedom and the exaltation of youth. John is silent. If he had a mouth, it would be hanging open. Arthur's mouth is open. Oh, that face. And Haster is of two minds regarding that blissful expression, the shiny eyes, the tremulous smile, but he knows which mind is his. Fuck off! Thank you. Arthur imagines the scene far more accurately than he knows, treasuring it. The offer stands. Haster has won this round quite handily, and Haster retreats. For now. It is time for stage four, the longest stage, the tending stage, and that begins with mirrors. Arthur wakes. John says in that way he does. What? Arthur stretches, tired. He never feels rested, no matter how long he sleeps, and gets out of bed. There's... there's a... Ooh. Arthur goes still. John? Mirrors. Mirrors? John stares at him, stares at his face, at the dark circles under his eyes, at the gauntness of his cheeks. Mm. Mirrors. They're everywhere. Just everywhere. Everywhere? Arthur is so confused, and his face is a journey, an epic of expressions that fly from confused to annoyed to uncaring to concerned. Why? Fuck if I know. I'll ask him at breakfast. And Arthur's face falls. John didn't expect that, doesn't understand that. Arthur? What? Arthur sounds normal, gets up, works his way toward his washroom. You, are you all right? Confusion, followed by some kind of sorrow, loss, maybe grief. Yes? Why? You, I just... I need to be sure. <sighs> I'm hot, John. It's all copacetic. He runs the water. Sure. There are mirrors in here, too. John has never seen Arthur's body fully naked, not from outside of it, only ever from Arthur's point of view. The scars are. His ribs are. Fuck. What? Arthur soaps up. Aster did something to the mirrors in here, because they're not steaming up. John can see everything so clearly. Arthur startles as John takes the soap away. And is there a problem? Let me do this, okay? Sure. The confusion is kind of adorable, or would be on a face less haggard. John takes his time, inspects as he goes, tries to determine just how bad it is, how far it's gone, what else he's missed. Arthur sort of zones out 
and lets him. John couldn't tell. Pastor was right. He should have been feeling all of this. Arthur can't be well. What else does he not know? John is quiet as Arthur dresses, as Arthur steals himself for yet another meal with his enemy and his child. And now John can see that process across his shockingly expressive face. Mm. Arthur freezes halfway out the door. What? Mirrors. Fucking hell, he can see Arthur from every angle. He looks so small in the hugeness of this place. All right. Arthur shakes it off and heads toward breakfast. 73 steps to prepare. 73 steps to ready himself for whatever's waiting today. 73 steps in which his face changes from pain to anticipation, to fear, to resignation, and the barest hint of steel that remains beneath the cracks. John had no idea. What else does he not know? Step one was getting John to view Haster's interference as positive. Step two was getting John to consider that the only way to keep Arthur safe is to become whole. Step three was watering, encouraging growth, ensuring the soil was just right. Step four is envy. This will require time to take root. Pastor isn't going to make the same mistake he did when he used Faroe to break Arthur. After all, He's finally sure where he went wrong. The finale came too soon. He hadn't given John time to wrestle with the fact that his mule was broken, and so John hadn't been ready to leave. Pastor won't repeat that error. No, John gets to linger, to dwell in the reality that without Haster, he cannot care for Arthur. To realize on his own that without Haster, Arthur would be dead. To realize that Haster can do for Arthur things John could never dream. To feel that envy coursing through his veins. Good morning. His tentacles wave, languid as if in deep water. Hi! <coughs> it gets you tight. <laughs> yes. Arthur's smile is beautiful. It's barely there, barely peeking, and in the mirrors, John can see it. It's like the hint of coming dawn, light from a sun that has yet to fully rise. It means good health in German. You say it when people sneeze, hoping they aren't sick. Faroe spends much of breakfast practicing the word to get it right. She doesn't. She also spends much of it sneezing. Is she getting sick? Arthur asks as she finally goes. There is a minor cold making its rounds among my humans. I have protected you from it. Arthur bristles. John can't take his eyes off the sight. But not for all. Her immune system needs to be built up. The antibodies she forms will be valuable to her as she grows. You, on the other hand, are in no shape for illness. And if you did catch a cold, it would likely go straight into your lungs. Arthur's frown is like his smile. It's barely there, but real. A hint of his essential self, still unable to poke leaves above the soil. I'm not that fragile. You are. I am telling you for a piece's sake. For John's sake. Arthur's eyes widen. John sees it. What? He's graduated from peace now? Haster is so pleased. 
Arthur is smart enough to play the game, even if he doesn't know he's doing it. Yes. It was my mistake, lessening him so. Though it is true that neither of us are what we ought to be, he is his own person, and I must respect that. Arthur's faces are magnificent. Bafflement, outright disbelief, suspicion. Kind of a cute look, if Haster were honest, so shady. Right. What the fuck are you doing now? Whatever you're doing to him, you fucking well better- John. Look. John looks. Arthur has hunched. The moment John spoke his own native tongue, Arthur hunched, white-knuckled over his food, jaw tight. John is baffled. A sneeze filters through the window from outside, followed by... Arthur really smiles. It's not a thousand-watt smile. It's still sad, still under eyes that grow too shiny. But he smiles, and it's real, and his cheeks gain some color. For her. We're done. Arthur, get up. What? What, you aren't going to force-feed me this morning? Music. We're late. You're behind. Go. Arthur shakes his head. Fine. Whatever you want, John. He stands. Curious. What? But you do not see what hurts him. Arthur's look is sharp. What? It, nothing hurts me. Your I can feel it. Clearly, you cannot. Not. But you can you at least you see it? What the fuck are you even talking about? Watching Arthur's face fall stops John in his tracks. John still hasn't figured out why. Good. Aster abruptly stands. Come, Arthur, John. Let us retire to your music room. What? Arthur staggers back slightly. Aster picks him up. Fuck! Fuck. Arthur fuck. struggles for two seconds before freezing like a rabbit. What the fuck are you doing? I believe it is time to make a point. Aster moves down the hall considerably faster than Arthur ever could, but not so fast that John can't still see his face in every surface. John will always see his face. Aster's made sure of it. The music room is vast, designed for entire orchestras to practice. Arthur has no orchestras. The musicians who play his music do so without ever having met him. Aster floats through the dust motes, through the beams of light from mullioned windows, and places Arthur at the piano. Play your latest work for me. Arthur is so confused. What are you doing? Play. Ugh. Haster sways Arthur to obey. It doesn't take much. Arthur would rather be playing than talking anyway. The new Jubilee's music is going to break hearts. It's gorgeous, it's grief-ridden, it's haunting, beautiful, and so moving that in any other circumstance, Haster would be swept away by it, riding on these wild and weird emotions. Good enough that, were Haster to come across this musician in the worlds somewhere, he would have taken him but that bears no further consideration.
Arthur finishes, hands deep in the keys, head down, sniffling, and not due to a cold. John, can you feel him? Haster knows he can't. There is a silent moment of struggling. <sighs> no. Look. Haster touches Arthur's chin to raise it. John looks. John sees, in the mirrors, sees that Arthur wears the heart's cry of that music on his face. John makes a small sound. I do this now not for myself and not for you, but for John. And he picks Arthur up again. Horrible. No, it is. Really. It's not. Arthur stiffens. Haster brings him up to his mask-like face. Think of John. He encourages Arthur to do so through the mark on his soul. Arthur stops being stiff. John sees. John watches, unable to avoid it, not wanting to avoid it, staring at the reflection on the ceiling and on the walls as Arthur goes still. His expression smooths out and... Keep them open for me. Arthur does though he wants to close them in relief. He's forgotten who is holding him. Haster knows how to use a damn mark. Why? Because you can't. And Haster stands there, waiting, until mere exhaustion takes its toll, merging with relaxation, forced or otherwise, it's rare. And Arthur falls asleep. He needs much healing. I can't do this for him. I can. For you. Not for him. I hate him, John. But you. For you, I will be your arms. Your touch. I will be your eyes. For when you cannot see him clearly. And it is the stupidest cheesy line in all of creation, but it works. John makes a sound Haster's been angling toward for weeks. A quiet sob. A concession. Damn you. That is not a no. Explain to him when he wakes. I will not be there for that and he carries them both back to Arthur's room and just leaves them on the bed. And now, he just has to wait. Haster retreats. Arthur wakes feeling... rested? Almost rested. Peaceful. Muscles lacking the ache that comes with constant tension, Stomach not roiling in anxiety, calm. He lies there for a moment, soaking it in. Then he freaks right out. John, what the fuck? He sits up. Arthur. Arthur hasn't actually panicked in some time. He can't do it fully, even now. Adrenal glands too exhausted, emotions too strained but he can be upset. He is definitely upset. What the fuck was that? He... I couldn't... John! He used the mark to influence you. And in doing so, gave you the best sleep you've had in... I don't even know how long. Arthur lunges from the bed and paces, breathing hard, (laughs) clutching his hair. What the fuck... What the fuck? What the fuck? John, I couldn't. John, he was in my head. He's in it now. So am I. But apparently, not the same way. John, what happened? (sighs) He was right. That's what happened. All this fucking time, he was right. 
About what? How to take care of you. What? Arthur is totally lost. He's pacing again, teeth bared. He's been telling me for weeks that you're not well. What? When? When we're talking. Nearly every damn meal. Arthur stops dead in his tracks and sputters. (laughs) You've been talking about me all this time. Yes, he's been saying that- Why the fuck couldn't you tell me? He snarls. So that's confusing as fuck, because it's absolutely incredible to see such intense expression on him, to hear it in his voice, and John would have given anything to make that happen. But unfortunately, it seems he did make that happen, and Arthur is mad at him. And John isn't sure what he did wrong, and it feels pretty awful that the first surge of real Arthurian anger John's seen since they got here is pointed his way. You let me stew and fear and tumble around in the miserable reality that you were fucking leaving me to, and all this time you were talking about me! Huh? Arthur's lost him. You what? You felt what? Why? Arthur's mouth hangs open. He throws his hands in the air and storms for the door. I have music to write. Wait just a damn minute. What are you talking about? We need to talk about this. Oh, we do. Now we do? It's been weeks. John, weeks of... She's gone, doing lessons, and that's fine. But you've barely fucking talked to me. And you... You two have been talking all the damn time over my head in words I can't understand. And when I asked you, you got so damn secretive and dismissive, like... Like... John desperately wants him to continue, wants him to feel these things. Is terrified he'll continue. Is terrified Arthur hates him out of the blue. Like I'm nothing... A nobody, hardly privy to the machinations of kings. And and here you've just been talking about my diet or something for weeks. Well, yes, actually, but that's not why I- Fuck you! Arthur slams his bedroom door and snarls his way down the hall. His eyes are wide, pupils blown, his teeth are still bared. He almost looks fierce if he also didn't look like a drowned cat. Arthur! No. No, you don't get to talk to me now. Not after all this. After... After... Did you plan that? Did you tell him to do that? Was that a... He was in my head. I could only think what he told me to. He... He was... Arthur. Fuck you, John. Just... Shut up! I have music to write. Oh, shut up! So he must be healing, because this would have been unthinkable a week ago. And it's pointed at John. John is silent. Arthur stalks over to the piano, misjudges slightly, and bangs his shin on the bench. Ah, that's your fault! Fuck's sake, Arthur. Arthur sits down and begins to play. The second Jubilee is not going to be the same. This one is angry. It's fire, waves of thick chords and repeated octaves, pounding torrents using the whole piano's range like some deadly storm. It's so much more than he's felt, obviously, clearly, in a long time, and John can't feel it. He can see, watch Arthur's face, watch his hands fly, but he can't feel it for himself. He knows, without even having to ask, that Pastor feels every bit. Something in John's heart twists.
Arthur finally finishes. Hands tight in the keys, arched like claws, the scribble of magical nib on paper recording every note he's made for the sake of the musicians who will play it in a week. I'm not ready to talk to you, John. That something twists more. Arthur goes back to practicing the first Jubilee's songs. He has to perform tonight, after all. Apart from directions, John doesn't speak until it's over. Arthur played the sad Jubilee, and though John would have predicted his new mood ruining its grief, it did not. It heightened it. The undercurrent of darkness, of somehow betrayed rage, only made the sorrow stronger, made it richer, added a knife-point sparkle to the whole bloody thing. And when Arthur is done... And the instrumentalists are finished, many of them shaking, a few with tears. There is a moment of stunned and awful silence in Haster's ostentatious ballroom. The applause begins from the back somewhere, started by someone daring to defy Haster's open mockery and unspoken command, and it immediately catches fire. Everyone is applauding, murmuring, sniffling. Arthur wipes his face on his right hand, completely avoiding his left, and sits there, glaring at the keys, not even standing to acknowledge the praise. John can see him in the reflection of the lacquered wood. Did Haster enhance that, too? And it is a deeply hurt look. John is vaguely aware of Haster speechifying the situation, taking credit, moving things right along. It's his moment. They may not get another moment all night if Haster decides to parade Arthur around, as he sometimes does with mockery. I'm sorry. Arthur swallows. John watches his Adam's apple bob. I'm sorry, Arthur. I didn't... I didn't realize how much that hurt you. You're... Paul, I have, John. It's barely audible, but John can hear him, can watch his lips tremble and move. Truly, all I have. John can't help it. What? Not even your precious Faroe? Faroe is... My heart is hers. But she's his. She'd be sad if I went, but it wouldn't interrupt her life in any way at all. I love her from afar. John, you're all I have, and I was... I've been losing you. Losing me? Every damn day you grew further away. That's how it felt, excluding me from... Communication you're having inside my own damn head. Not telling me how you feel or anything. Not even telling me why you'd suddenly demand I eat or or drink some water or go lie down. None of it. You made me feel like a burden, John. Like a project. As if I'm unaware that's what I am. I already know that. You don't have to. You didn't have to make it worse. Well, fuck. Arthur, you're not any of those things. I am. I have been since we got here. Since she came back. I'm not stupid, John. Whatever 
whatever you, whatever I was that made you change, that helped you grow, that's gone. I'm not that anymore. And I may have to be again. John is sure he will be again. His anger today enforces that hope, but now is not the time to bring it up. I don't care. Arthur wipes his eyes. In sickness and in health. That's what you humans say, right? (laughs) Arthur's laugh is weak and surprised, but at least it happens. John, that's... that's a wedding vow. Well, the a couple. So? I can still make that vow to you. I think I already did, anyway. In sickness and in health. You're sick right now. That doesn't mean I go... That... That doesn't change anything. In sickness and in health. You wacko. All right. Have your way. The anger is gone. His brow has smoothed out. The sorrow is back, by itself. But now it looks like calm waters rather than a sucking void. John takes his hand. Arthur squeezes it back. John wishes he could take Arthur in his arms like Haster. He wishes... so many things. Are we good? We're good. Don't do that to me again, though. Us. I won't. He dares. Quirk. Arthur's lips quirk. Bastard. John could cry. When did they last play like this? Jerk. <laughs> Arthur laughs again, so soft. There he is. Booms a new voice. A truly unnerving number of tentacles come slithering in from the right like fast-moving smoke. <laughs> Arthur gasps and hurls himself out of them, off the bench in the other direction, trips on his cape, and lands on the floor. A being hovers there, and it is a horrible, huge eye. Green irised, pupil split, it drips with tentacles and some clear, smoking fluid, and its voice makes the air between them tremble and contort. The man of the hour... Hello, little one. The guests don't talk to Arthur. They don't dare after all Haster's done. Uh. Get away from it. For it to be defying Haster this openly is... I'm currently in negotiations to buy you. Your sorrow is exquisite. I just wanted to know if you could tell me what you're so sad about. I'd love to have a supply of it on hand, whatever it is. And if it requires time to obtain, well... No use letting the grass grow under one's... feet. (laughs) The thing hovers a meter off the ground, tentacles quivering with its humor. Arthur's reflection goes pale. Liar. Liar! Well... The being cannot hear him. Arthur shuffles back, getting caught on his cape, unable to stand. Haster. Pardon? You're sad about Haster? Well, that's very... Haster! And John feels that through the mark. Haster arrives. He doesn't land with the architectural mayhem he did before, does not come in fire or explosions or crawling black mist of flesh-eating power. Oh, but he is there and present and pushing the floating eye back by dint of pure anger. Kiega, well, I hadn't invited you, as I recall. What a pleasant surprise. Arthur, get up and leave. We are going to fight. Now? Arthur finally turns onto his hands and knees to find his feet. 
This is a challenge. Move. Go on, Arthur. Aster does not turn around. Kiega will wait until you are gone. Oh, will I? Now, the air in the whole room is warping. Go! Arthur runs. He's out of breath by the time he reaches his room, hands shaking, badly sweating. But all his sounds are hidden by the terrible noise behind. God's fighting is not a quiet indoor activity. Fucking asshole. I remember that guy now. He shows up every millennia or so. Arthur can't catch his breath. He, he, he what? He's got a temper a mile long, and I... You know... I can't remember what I did to him to make him so mad. Whatever it is, he remembers and keeps coming around trying to settle the score. He wasn't going to buy me. Hell no. He said that to upset you, to see what you'd do. If you wanted to get away from Haster, it didn't matter. But if you wanted to stay, if being bought would upset you, then hurting you might hurt him. Arthur rubs his face. That's stupid. He's old temper. Pastor's got this. Don't worry. Even though he's not whole? John goes quiet. Sometimes you slipped. Arthur peels off his sweat-soaked uniform. He still hasn't caught his breath. Slipped? That's as small as John's voice ever gets. You want to be whole. I heard you. You could have just fucking told me, you know? No wonder Arthur had thought John was going to leave him. I thought... I... Does it hurt, John? Arthur is still uniform half off, staring at nothing. But Haster's mirrors are fucking everywhere, and John can see his face. See the openness there. The readiness for whatever John says, even if it is painful. A weary anticipation. Yes. John decides lying is a bad idea now. It does. I'm sorry. Arthur finishes stripping and leaves his clothes in a sodden pile. So that... that actually had nothing to do with me? John is wondering how Arthur called for Haster through the mark. John is wondering what that was, because the power of the mark goes one way. John is wondering because he hasn't been able to feel anything from Arthur, and then the one thing he had felt is impossible. No, it didn't. Though I have a bad feeling more like this is coming. We're becoming noticeable. You are. You. You're noticeable, Arthur. That didn't come out right. I mean, you stand out. Thanks. Arthur's expression is absolutely dry. (sighs) Fucking forget it. I'm glad you're okay. Arthur still hasn't caught his breath. John stares at him as he gets in the shower. The paleness, the bones, the scars. This has to end. We're going to switch things up tomorrow. Are we? Arthur is exhausted. John helps him wash his hair. Yes. No arguments. Sure, John. No arguments. Arthur has checked out. John's not surprised. Today was a lot. More than Arthur's been through in... in a while. I won't hide things from you again. I'm never leaving you. I'm sorry you felt like I was. That got his attention. Shower or not, 
John can tell Arthur's eyes are filling. In sickness and in health, eh? In sickness and in health. Now let's get you to bed. If you enjoyed this production of Surrogate, the Director's Cut, please read the original written work on AO3, where it is still actively updating as of May 2024. A link is in the work notes, where you can also find the social medias of all the production cast. Malevolent was written and produced by Harlan Guthrie, and all characters depicted here belong to their respective creators. The cast and management produced this show for no monetary gain, and all rights remain with the authors. Any sound effects or music used in this production were obtained legally or are created by the production cast. Please let us know your thoughts, and as Kane would say, Stay tuned for the next episode! <laughs>